Okay, so this is gonna be simple. We're just gonna use whatever herbs we have. Oh, you know what though? Before I do that, I can't think of how to use those other things, so I'm just gonna pass these around and crush them up and smell them. And you'll see what I'm talking about with regards to the uh, yuzu. If we were doing Thai or something, I'd say put it in there, you know? And actually when Meredith comes back in, it might be that we can figure out a way to use, I still have one in there. It might go, she made a, um, a salsa. It might be nice in the salsa actually. Yeah, I might actually talk to her about putting that in. So I'm putting sage in, I'm putting oregano in. And I'm going with the oregano flowers, I want the stronger flavor. And we'll do some rosemary. And maybe once again, a tiny, did anybody notice the lavender? Did it? Well, I didn't want you to. But was there anything you couldn't quite figure out what you were tasting? Because that's what the goal is. I didn't see you make it. I couldn't have told what was in it. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, well, so I eventually want you to get to the point where you could pick out the other flavors. Yeah. Okay. But I want to make it so you never quite know the lavender's there, you know? It's just like, and what's that, you know? Um, because it's just, when it's there, it's too much, you know? It needs to be this, like, ephemeral, ephemeral tease in the background, you know? Do you use basil flowers? Yeah. I use all the herb flowers. Yeah, they're all great. With the exception of turmeric, I have no idea if I can use the turmeric flower. You know? It sure is gorgeous, though. You know? The turmeric and the ginger flowers are really lovely. And I should look it up. You probably can. You know? Usually, if a plant is edible, not all, I mean, there are exceptions. Like, you know, rhubarb, the stems are edible. You don't want to eat the leaves. You know? And I have no idea about the flower. But with lots of plants, anyways, you know, and all the herbs that I use, I'm able to use the flowers that I can think of. I can't think of one I can't, you know. Um, but like I say, sometimes they surprise you, you know. I one time got really carried away with chive flowers and it was way strong. You know, they're stronger than the chives. Yeah. Okay, so we got that. Oh, we got some more time here, good. And so, it's pretty interesting I recommend looking up a really good authentic Thai recipe for like a Thai green curry sauce. The stuff they throw in there is pretty fascinating and it's just like, boy is it good when you make it. And so they throw whole bay leaves in it and they blend them up and they throw the entire cilantro plant in, root, stem and everything and blend it all up. and. We don't even, I, when I make it, we don't even put the peppers in, which would kind of help pull it all together because Diane doesn't like hot. But it is just like so much better than any Thai food that I buy. You know? um, and it's not that they can't do it too, it's just that we can make it so fresh right there and we have as much of any ingredient as we want, you know, whereas they have to pay attention to money. And we're using everything we grew. We have a nice, you know, lemongrass plant, you know, just, it's pretty exciting. And also, what do you think about putting one of these leaves in the salsa? Salsa Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. So then I'm going to just put a small amount of salt in first um, and try to get the right mix to get it to blend up without using alcohol. I mean, alcohol, without using water, you know, or alcohol. <laughs> you know. And it's easier to do this in a food processor. I'm hoping I can make it work in the blender. That much salt? It's, oh, yeah. This is, this is going to be a salt. I'm making an herb salt. You're going to use this like salt. I'm going to put more salt in this. It's going to be lots of salt, and you're going to eat it like you eat salt. Yeah, right. It's an herb salt. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do like my salt, though. But no, I, I tend to apply more at the table. I know better than to go for the level of salt I like. It's starting to get there. And if you got liquid, and you know that trick, right? If you're doing garlic and this kind of thing, you want to add it in early to a small amount of liquid. Because this big thing, otherwise, is just going to get little pieces nipped off it. If it's in a tight little slurry, just enough to cover the uh, um, blades, then it's going to get totally chopped up. In general, you add only enough liquid to, get, to make sure it blends easily, you know, but gets all of the um, 
herbs chopped up fine, then you go ahead and you add the rest of the stuff in there. You know? And so usually if it's a dressing, it's vinegar, but if it's something else, it might be oil or it might be, you know, sometimes what I'll do is I'm making a soup and I want to get a lot of flavor in there. And so I'll take a little bit of the soup out, put it in my blender and a lot of herbs in there and blend the soup up and have this super concentrate that then goes back into the soup. Um, and I do that a lot with the parsley. I mean, that's one of my favorites. Boy, you got a soup and it's just, you know, it's hard to get the flavor in a soup first. You don't know what it's going to taste like until the next day usually. But you get a big bump from the parsley. You know, it just really pulls it all together. Yeah, it's starting to be chopped up enough that I don't feel like I have to chop it more. Just get the salt in there. And I do usually use the Himalayan, but I was out of it and had to buy locally because I wasn't driving to the co-op. And so I'm using up the non-Himalayan on you guys. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> it's sea salt, you know. <laughs> now, when do you use this again? Well, I'm going to have you just try a little bit on the pasta right now and see what it tastes like. But it really needs to sit for a week, you know. And then you use it instead of salt. Oh, okay. It is your salt. It's an herb salt. So you use about the same amount. You might be able to use a little less because there's going to be other flavors in it, you know. But you use it as salt. That's why I'm putting so much salt in it, because it is salt. <laughs> but unfortunately, I really don't know how strong it's going to take taste today. I should have made this last week, but I just thought of it when I was talking to Meredith this afternoon. It's like, that's a great one to show people, because it's really not widely known, but it's a really nice way to preserve herbs and make having herb flavor you know, readily available without having to stop and think all the time. So what I'm going to do is put some pasta in a bowl. Patrick, did you do dry herb salt? Sure. Yeah, I would, I would grind them up well before I added the salt in. To get those volatiles out, that would speed it up. Otherwise, it would take longer. You know? But I'd go with some fresh parsley. <laughs> of course I'd go with some fresh <laughs> there you go. So you're tasting the herb salt? That'll just get better and better, by the way. You know, by the end of a week, those flavors will be nicely blended. It'll be really, you know. But why you can taste it all now is because of the parsley. Do I didn't put the parsley in there? It makes the difference, you know. It just brings it out right away. And I enjoy the lemon. Good. Yeah, I would have rather had a little more parsley in it because it would have just made that lemon more less. It's kind of too separate, you know. I want it to be more blended and have the tarragon come forward a little more. All right, so I basically did talk about the 90% that are the three main families. The ones that we didn't cover are the outliers. So the bay, I, I talked about that. I talked a little bit about the lemongrass. The lemongrass is not hardy. It has to come in. But as the first person that ever sold it to me said, you can keep it alive in just a northern window. You know, it's going to go kind of dormant. And you don't overwater it. You let it go a little dry. You just know how to keep it, how you just keep a plant along that you're not trying to grow. You're just trying to keep alive. You can do that. Then as soon as it's warming up in the springtime, pot it up, you know, divide it, pot it up, whatever and take it out in the nice days and let it start growing. And then by the time it's past frost, you can put it in the ground and you'll be on your way. Um, and of course, the best part, you can make tea from the leaves of that, but the best part is that bulb on the bottom. That's the main part. But, but you can make a tea from the leaves that's part of your sauce. So you get more flavor out of a given amount of it, you know. And other ones, the ginger, the key thing to know about the ginger and the turmeric is they actually don't want to get, we think of them as tropical, but they're edge plants. They don't want to get much above 90. So you want to grow them in a way that they're missing the hot afternoon sun. And if it's a really hot day and you're home, water them. Because it's the soil temperature that matters. You know? So if you get the soil temperature cooled down, they'll do better. Mustard is a brassica. That's one of the families that we don't, we don't talk about a lot. And mustard is a pretty major herb, especially in French cooking. But it's, you know, and I say herb, you know, this is really, I never quite figured out what's a spice and what's an herb. 
except for the spices traveled well, you know, but I mean, like cilantro's both got the herb part and the, you know, and so if I can grow it, to me it's an herb. That's what I think you're interested in, right? It's like, what can I grow that adds to the food? So I might be speaking, maybe mustard is a spice and not an herb. I don't really care. It's well worth using and you can grow it. You can grow any mustard and collect the seeds and use it for mustard, but you can also get the specific one and of course it's very easy to grow. And that fresh seed is going to be very spectacular. And just blend it up in a, in a food mill and use it in anything where you're looking for a little bit of bite and whenever you want to get some of that emulsion, you know. Um, that bite really helps. It's dynamic. Um, lemon verbena is, I have it on here because although I hardly ever use it in cooking, it has its moments, you know. And so one of those moments was at the um, Mountaineer Country Club, we did an ice cream. And it was a lemon verbena lavender ice cream. And it was pretty spectacular. You know, once again, it's the kind of thing you got to go really light with. Lemon verbena is mostly used in the perfume business, you know. So it's going to get, it's going to be overwhelming if you overdo it, you know. So you go lightly. Mostly people use it in teas. But, you know, little bits just dynamically used. You know, it's one of those, one of those lavender things. These are the things that you just, you know, you slip in there and nobody knows what the heck you did, you know. But it's that taste unto itself. That leaf that I just gave Meredith, that's the same kind of thing, you know. It's like, no one's going to know what that taste is. It's not a taste of it's the yuzu leaf. Yeah. And so, yeah, we talked, I think, pretty thoroughly about the, the difficulty of growing in this climate, you know. Um, and when I think of the plants that, that died and the path to this class, it's pretty heartbreaking. But we might have a great year next year, you know. I mean, you can really do great. And I'm hoping that, that, that going with the, the much more rock and also being disciplined about removing those cup plants for next year, and not letting, you know, if, they, if everything does well there, I'm going to be removing several of those plants because they're going to want more space. But I think if we do that, we might be able to report to you. I might get Lisa to come fil film and do an addendum that shows that we made it through a, a reasonable summer anyways, you know. I don't know what's likely to make it being in a bowl when you're getting, like, I think in May it was like 30-some inches. And then in, in from the, the middle of the second last week of July to the middle of the second week of August, it was like pushing 20 inches, you know. I mean, down here I think they measured 15, but up at my house I had 19. You know, my house is right up the hill. So I don't, I don't know if one of us measured wrong or what, but I don't care. That's just an awful lot of rain. It's like, you know, pushing five inches a week with the gray. It's just asking a lot for plants that, you know, want to be in a Mediterranean climate. And so propagation, you know, those things I showed you are way worth doing. And, you know, no, learn the tips. And, okay, so... I was here to figure out that probably why your leaks took so long was because you didn't have them in the dark. But there's a book, there's two books that, that you can just go to and figure out exactly how to get any seed going the way it's supposed to. One is the newer version of Susan Ashworth's Seed to Seed, and the other is Nancy Bubel, Bubel B U B I L, I'm pretty sure, is Seed Grower's Handbook. And both of those will tell you what you need. For each seed. You can probably Google any of it, you know, but I still kind of like having books that are so I can just go there and not have to be on the computer. But I mean, the problem too is you can Google it and it might be wrong, you know. <laughs> Somebody that's invested the time in writing a book has a better chance of not being wrong, you know. Um, like I said, you know, I got told on the internet and I believed it that the best time to start Bay was in the fall and it took me eight, six to eight months, like they said. I started mine. Did yours take, by the way, the Bay you took home? They go down there and get one. I got several that are rooted and growing already, you know. And they did it in like six or eight weeks, you know. So the internet is not as reliable. I think the books are probably more reliable, and I'd recommend getting the books. Um, if not, if you figure out quickly which, which sources of information on the internet are worth using. And make, pay attention to that, because you don't want to go back to the same person that was wrong before, you know. Like I said, there really aren't things you can do to kill those diseases and the, the common advice everywhere is and I have to concur with it if you get those diseases move your move your garden you know be ready to move you know um, and stay away from it for a long time you know at least five years if you can do ten it's all the better you know um, and so the other thing is if you can't do that because you only have one place for an herb garden then you want to be even more vigilant the minute you see those plants starting to go south you want to dig them, you know? And then you want to put a cover crop in that little area for a little while at least. And then come back and dilute, get some more, you know, gravel, char, 
you know, a little bit of fertilizer kind of stuff and make that area way less of that pathogen. And then probably look into buying trichoderma. It's a little pricey, but I think it'll last a good while if you keep it refrigerated. And treat the roots of the next plant you're putting out there with trichoderma. Trichoderma is a fungus that eats funguses. And there's a good chance that you can hopefully suppress and outcompete if you do have a soil fungus, you know, because we can move, you know, I got, I could be anywhere in this garden. I chose there because that's where we most want it, but I could have picked the top of any other bed. You can't do that, possibly. So if you can't, then those are other strategies for trying to get around the fact that some of these diseases we get, like Phytophthora, are persistent and pretty much deadly. And the thing is, they may not manifest in a dry year, you know, but then in a wet, a wet year, that's when you have a problem. So that's why, you know, depending on what your soil is, paying a lot of attention to drainage is a big deal, you know. Um, other ones like Fusarium are everywhere all the time. I don't even know if Fusarium affects herbs, but I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. And they're more about stress, so if you can make sure your plants are. But how do you not, you know, I taught an allium class this spring, and part of what I had to teach about is how all the rules are out the window when you've had as much rain as we had. Plants that were supposed to make top sets didn't make top sets. Plants that, didn't, that weren't supposed to make top sets did make top sets. And when you read the books, they say, under stress, this is what happens. So you just, you know, you have, part of being a grower is to let the biofeedback teach you, you know, to keep doing it and not to give up, to have that backup of plants and just keep and having at it, you know. And you will have plenty of success. It's worth doing. It's not like we don't grow lots of herbs and get to use lots of herbs. But then we have those years, you know. Um, and... Bill Whipple is a pretty famous nut and tree guy, and he thought he'd figured out fire blight. He had a 30-year-old pear, 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 pear orchard that was incredibly productive, and he just was the expert on it. And I was talking about one of my similar experiences this. He said, I just had mine, Pat. My whole orchard went down to fire blight. You know? um, it just can happen. You know? We are dealing with life. You know? And the good news about life is it goes on. And if you're a gardener, then you probably always think there's another day. You know, it's part of being a gardener is, is you have some hope. You have some faith. You can't garden if you don't. You know, anybody that's still growing toma toma tomatoes outdoors in North Carolina, you're a believer, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It takes some work, you know. And so the harvesting part, people pretty much got that. That's pretty critical to try and take a third, you know. If it's really growing lush, go for a third early. And if you can't use it, preserve it. Did I talk about how easy it is to dry herbs? It's in the handout, but I'll go over it. It's just like paper bag, bundle them up, tie up the end, take the end that's um, tied up, you know, the stem end, and pull the bag up right around that and tie, it, tie that up and hang it in an attic or someplace else that's good and warm and has good air circulation. Leave it alone. Leave it alone for a long time. Forget about it till you remember it, you know, and they'll be really nice and dry. You don't want to go ahead and get them too soon. If they seem dry, but they're not really crispy and stuff, they're going to mold on you, you know. So let them go. And of course, the dehydrator is even better. But I'd stay away from the oven. You just can't control the heat enough, you know. Um, I'd find, find that hot spot in your house or somebody else's house and use that, you know. But it's really easy. And I mean, at um, Meredith's old house, did you plant the lemon balm or did Rocco? Right, you hate that. I love that lemon balm. <laughs> you have to fight it, but I get to harvest it. And so lemon balm is a, a delightful tea. It's antiviral. It's a great thing to drink for, you know, when you have colds because you've been drinking lots of hot fluids. It's specifically antiviral to the herpes virus, but it, it, I'm convinced it has impact on the other ones. And I don't mind it because I'm drinking it anyways. I just go over and whack back big clumps of this lemon balm that's taking over this one bed and dry it like that. And I have jars and jars full of lemon balm. When somebody's telling me it's sick, I give it to them and say, try it. It might help. You know, and it's just not hard to dry, you know. Um, I can't keep up with it, though. <laughs> it's still... yeah, so that's one I didn't cover. I mentioned it a little bit with mugwort, but you do want to learn, like, don't put mint in the kind of bed we just made. You know? Mint doesn't need it. You know, give mint your, it a, a corner where you can mow around it you know, or put it in a pot. Don't put mugwort in the ground, period. You know? I, love, I love lemon balm. I'm going to put it in beds, but I can understand why Mary, this response is different than mine. You know? It's a wonderful herb, but it's too... And, a uh, good friend, Chip Hope, who now is running the um, Appalachian State um, student farm, worked with me, and I just saw him for, after many years at the um, Organic Fest, uh, Organic, Fe Organic um, Growers School social event, and he was saying, 
I'm embarrassed to even look at you because I did plant that lemon balm in that person's bed and it did take it over. Because you know? <laughs> he was like, I was like, you really don't want to put that because these people rented these like 10 by 15 beds, you know? And I said, you really don't want to put that in there. You know, they can pick from our lemon balm. They know they want their own. I said, he said, mine doesn't spread. And now he said, I realized mine didn't spread because there were so many other established plants around it, it couldn't. But you put it where it can take the space, and that's going to happen. There are plants that you got to know if they spread because they will eat. You know, all that work preparing that, try to keep the mint out of it if you get it in there, you know. Um, just don't, don't go there. You know, figure out the ones you don't want in there and just grow the ones that you did that work for. And the mint can be anywhere, you know. Um, and it sh you should have it. I mean, if you're making a tabbouleh and you don't have plenty of mint, it's not authentic. You want that mint. I mean, Diane, every time we got peas in the springtime, she's like, where's the mint? You know, there are places where mint is not just a delightful drink, but key to, to a cuisine, you know, and Mideastern uses a lot of it. So have it somewhere, but keep it out of the main herb garden. I think that pretty much is it, unless there's questions. Yeah, I want to tell you one thing important. Um, remember Nate Kleiman at the Experimental Farm Network? He brought us some very interesting seeds, including this one called Giginia, and it's from Bolivia. And it's used like cilantro, but it doesn't bolt. And I grew it this year and it did great here, even with the crazy rain. And so how was it cilantro flavor-wise? Because there are things that are supposed to be cilantro and the flavor really isn't cilantro. They use it for that and they make this salsa that's always on the table. Um, it's, it's a little different. It's a thicker leaf. It's not a ferny leaf. Right, it's yeah. a thick almond-shaped type leaf, a little thicker. And um, it goes really high up and it did fantastic. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I'd like to get some seed on that. I'll have to remember to order it. U-I-L-L-Q-U-I-N-A. And you can look it up online. It's a Bolivian thing. And he's got it at experimentalfarmnetwork.org. You can order the seeds. I highly recommend them. A, that's a great company. They have really crazy, wild, wonderful seeds. There's a couple other ones. Papalo, I think. Very hard to germinate. Very, very hard to germinate. But quite nice if you grow it. And then one that's very easy to grow. You can pick it up at the Herb Fest usually. It looks like what people call smart weed. Do you know all know smart weed? It's the viney thing with opposite leaves and those pink long flowers. Yeah. There's one that looks exactly like that, and it's called Vietnamese cilantro, and it tastes like cilantro kind of, but it's also spicy. You know, and so and it's actually kind of nice to grow because it's also arborage. The smart weeds are arborage for big eyed bugs, and they won't take out all of your flea beetles, but they'll feed on them which means there won't be quite so many. And anything that feeds on flea beetles is a friend of mine, yeah. you know. So there are, there's a world, I mean, this, you know, this was more about using the standard ones and how to get a standard herb garden in. But you, we could do like an ongoing discussion of all the amazing herbs that are in the world, you know. And all the plants that are, like the yuzu is not used as an herb with a leaf, but it can be, you know. Um, tea, people are now using tea leaves to season things, you know. I've got a tea plant growing up my, on my um, porch, and it last fall, last December rather, totally surprised me with all these lovely camellias, because it's a camellia. And it was just, it was like lit up. It was like ornamental. Did you get to see that? Did I show you that? Awesome. I, think I tried to send you a, a, a picture, and I don't think it got to you. Yeah. But this year it should happen. We should actually bring it down if it's, I think it's a little bit, it might be still doing it for the Christmas thing. We should bring it down and show people what they could grow for a Christmas gift. Yeah. So there's lots and lots of herbs that we could be, you know, ex going beyond and into, you know, a world of seasonings that we could learn. And that, that makes the authentic stuff, that really makes it fun. One that we haven't grown this year, but we've grown that's like the um, ginger and the turmeric is called galanga. And it's a ginger flavor, but spicy as all heck, you know. And so it's part of what makes Thai hot. But it's this hot that's not from peppers, but from this galanga. And it's very nice stuff used with moderation. G-A-G-A-N-G-L-A. Yeah. G-A-L-A-N-G-A-L. Yeah. Say that again. G-A-L-A-N-G-A-L. G-A-L? Uh-huh, Galanga. It's in like Tom Gossi. And it's quite easy to grow. Not as easy to find to get to grow it, but you know, but you know, easy to grow, you know. So there's, yeah, there's a world of those. Um, and if you find some fun ones, call us up on the radio show and let's talk about them. Um, does everybody know how to do that if you want to do it? I kind of mentioned it. You don't actually call us up. You email lisa at livingwebfarms.org and you can copy to pat at livingwebfarms.org and say, I'd like to be on the radio show. And then she'll tell you how to 
download this app called Zoom, and then you can do it through your computer, and the connection's real good. Um, and I can answer, uh, if you have questions about anything you learned here or anything else, I can answer those questions. But also, you can just tell us about what you discovered. Yeah. Or you can just send a question and Pat will answer it. That's the other way to do it, too. But I like having you on the phone. You know, I like getting to ask another question and have that back and forth. You know, it's, like, it's far more dynamic. But yeah, you can just send the question and I'll answer it, too, for sure. OK, I think that's it. Yeah? Well, I, last year, I didn't have a garden right outside of my patio. So this year, I put a really small one in. But all of a sudden, I have all these mosquitoes. And I was just wondering if there's any relationship between oh, yes. or if it's just the rain. I think it's probably just the rain. I check your gutters. Okay. You know, that's a much more likely culprit. Now, with as much rain as we're having right now, those cup plant sections might not dry out. And maybe the mosquitoes have figured out how to lay in there. But if we get some wind and some hot sun, they're all toast. You know? But if you have nonstop rain, then that'll become another place. But and there's a few other plants that might do that, but probably not likely. They're not going to live in your soil. They have to actually be aquatic. You know? If, by the way, there's some aspect, if you were doing, let's say, um, duckweed, they could be living in that, you know? um, then you could get a BT. There's a BT that's specific for flies, and mosquitoes are flies. So you know, they're in the same family. They're Deptera. You know? So you could, you could take them down that way. You know? And BT, do people know about BT? It's, BT is a very cool soil organism, um, and it's toxic to insects if they ingest it. And so there's one for cabbage loopers. There's one for potato beetles. Um, I'm pretty sure that the one I just got now, I'm pretty sure that's a BT, one for um, weevils and Japanese beetles. That's a brand new one. It's real expensive and hard to get. They have a, they're working real hard at learning how to make it. Um, and there's one for flies, mosquitoes. And so, you know, you want to, I recommend getting the organic versions. And only recently did we get a, a potato ver organic one back. It was, we were able to use it for years, and then they made it only genetically engineered. And that's not something that people who care about organic want. But finally, I just heard that there's now a potato bug. But the truth is, potato bugs, get on the radio show, and I'll tell you how to grow enough flowers that you don't need to worry, potato beetles, you don't need to worry about them. But if you had, put a bunch in and didn't have your farmscaping up, you could call us up and we could find you, help you find the organic one. So those all work great. If you got a mosquito problem and you find that you can't drain the water, get the BT. Okay, well thank you. Good luck.